On today's Transport Evolved, Tesla extends its Model S warranties to cover fires, a roundup from EVS 27, Tokyo Motor Show and LA Auto Show, and how many car buyers don't even know what comes with getting an EV. Coming up next on Transport Evolved. Transport Evolved is sponsored by AudiblePodcast.com. To claim your free audiobook from a selection of over 85,000 growing titles for your iPod or MP3 player, head to www.audiblepodcast.com forward slash Transport Evolved. And by your kind donations. To make a gift to the show or to set up a monthly subscription, head to www.transportevolved.com. We thank you for your kind support. And proud to support Chronovirus, the latest book by long island author Aaron Crocco. To find out more and get a free chapter, head to www.aaroncrocco.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to episode number 175 of Transport Evolved, recorded on Sunday, November 24th, 2013. My name is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. And I'm Mark Chatterley. How are you, Nikki? I'm very well, thank you, Mark. This week, how are you? I've been ill all of this week. It's been a great week. Um, but no, let's ignore that. That there's, It's been a good week for EVs. Wow, it's, an interesting week for EVs. It's <laughs> been a fairly good week for EVs. And if you'll excuse me a second, I'm just going to turn myself up because I can't hear myself. Here we go. It's one of those weeks. Ah, never mind. Uh, but as you say, Mark, it's been one of those busy weeks for the EV world. And our guest today, we can really only have one guest because uh, when it comes to auto shows and globe trotting, there is only one guest that we can have, the one, the only Mr. John Volker from High Gear Media, Green Car Reports, Motor Authority, etc., etc. in an unusually tidy office, John. I beg your pardon, the office is always like this. <laughs> what are you talking about? With, a, with a brand new camera as well. So you're, we, we're, we've got you now, John, in, in, H, in H, uh, HD quality, I reckon. Yeah. 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 Very, very high quality, and you've got a stripy shirt on just to test that your camera can handle the lines. Yes, and given the high def, I also shaved, which I <laughs> don't normally do. So, moving along with electric vehicles. So, uh, you've been you've been busy in this past week, John. You've been off to the uh, been to off to Tokyo, haven't you? You were the guest of yes. Honda. Yes, uh, guest of Honda. Uh, spend a couple of days driving some new Hondas, largely combustion engines, new and more efficient ones. But I also got a chance to drive their micro commuter vehicle, which oh. is, you can think of it essentially as their, their uh, Renault Twizy competitor. Right. For those people who are familiar, it's a very small, uh, enclosed or almost enclosed uh, electric vehicle, low range. What they demonstrated, they were really trying to hit two marks with that. Um, the first one, I don't, I don't have the pictures yet. They're still on my camera, but um, th they're both sort of saying, well, we think electric vehicles are only suitable for very short run sort of urban commuting, low speed. Um, but they also demonstrated some of their autonomy features, um, including what they call rather picturesquely duck following, which is that <laughs> your micro commuter vehicle locks onto a license plate of a car ahead of you. It, you on your iPad, which is controlling the car, get permission from the car ahead to follow. And then you sort of take your hands off the wheel and your micro commuter vehicle follows at a set distance, braking appropriately, changing lanes when the car ahead does and so forth. Wow. This is a very interesting wow. technology. We've not seen, I mean, we've seen this before. Volvo has been doing something very similar with a bus or a, no, it was a, a truck, wasn't it? Where, truck where, on the motorways. Where, where people could follow. Right. The road trains. Right. And, but we've not seen this technology um, used, I don't think, with just a number plate, locking onto a number plate. So that's, that's a new part of it, isn't it? Yes. Yes. And um, this is all still very experimental. They're not going to roll it out anytime soon, but I think they have plans to put a few dozen micro commuter vehicles into use in a test in three different cities, if I recall. But again, it's sort of Honda saying, well, yes, electric cars, but not real cars just these sort of small, very limited, this is a two-seater, it's tandem, um, um, low-speed, very limited duty cars for anything larger. Um, Honda, along with Toyota, 
uh, still are very much believers in hydrogen fuel cells. Now, this is in a very interesting thing, and we'll, we'll come on to the hydrogen maybe a bit later on in, in, in this section. But we, there were some interesting cars debuted at uh, Tokyo, um, and we're going to start with Tokyo because that's where you were, John. Right. Um, the VW Twin Up diesel plug-in concept. Now, right. let's start with this and maybe just, just give people a quick rundown of it. It's essentially the Volkswagen Up, which is its smallest um, mini microcar, isn't it? Microcar segment commuter city vehicle, essentially. Yeah, well, it's, it, I, in the States, we call it a mini car. It's the class below something like a Ford Fiesta. Right. Um, it, it's bigger than a Mitsubishi I, but only slightly. Right. Um, right. Coming two and four doors uh, in petrol form with a sort of one liter three cylinder engine. The twin up is uh, the powertrain from their experimental XL1, the, the sort of very, very, very lightweight aerodynamic yep. two seater. Uh, which they're only making, if I recall, what two hundred of or something. Two hundred and fifty, and they are they're so operating well. a lottery now, essentially, right. to right. see who gets one because the the number of people who who said we want one has been so high that they're now going, oh, we're going to have to effectively screen people and see who gets the best one now. Who who sorry, who's best suited for it now? You've driven the XL1, John. I've driven the XL1. And from my experience, uh, combined with the, 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 the stats that Volkswagen has provided for the twin up, I don't ever see this car being a viable commuter vehicle because it's got a tiny 30 kilowatt electric motor. Uh, is it 20 kilowatt and 30 kilowatt, uh, 20 kilowatt electric motor and 30 kilowatt diesel engine or is it the other way around? I can't remember now thinking about it. Um I should have pulled out the specs, but I, I think your point is right. It may have marginal acceleration. The XL1 did okay, um, but it's a much lighter weight vehicle. And the more aerodynamic as well. Like a steel bodied, yeah. you know, two or four door car. I mean, they were talking about, uh, interestingly, Volkswagen in its press release did something that Volkswagen never does. I mean, it never talks about the 0 to 30 time of any of its cars, but it actually gave a 0 to 30 time uh, for the, the, the twin up. And then kind of wedged in the 0 to 62 time uh, later on in the press release. And I think the 0 to 62 was 16 seconds. Now, yeah. the last time we had cars being sold with 0 to 62 times of 16 seconds, um, how do we put this? Um, we would we'd just come out of the Second World War, John. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's true. My brother my brother used to drive, in fact, I think he might still drive this, uh, a diesel uh, car. I can't remember who makes it, but it's, I, it might be a Skoda, a diesel Skoda, and it's not to uh, 62 time, it's about 18 seconds. And yeah, then this it's, is a car that's about 15 for years general old. For use, I think that acceleration was fairly common for smaller cars in the 80s. You could still find it in the 90s and even into the 2000s in the States. The US does demand more and faster acceleration than other markets. I'd wager that 16 seconds is on the low end, but there may still be some cars out there. Yeah, maybe. What, maybe. what about the uh, two-cylinder Fiat 500, for instance? Mm, maybe, the and, twin air. The twin air. Uh, and I do think, I mean, maybe it's my, my depressive mood I'm in at the moment, but, but I, I think it does show the way we're going to be going with cars. I don't think we're going to have the the money to afford petrol and diesel in the quantities needed to even drive a, a 30 or 40 mile per gallon car. I think we're going to end up with cars like this, which are hyper efficient, but have huge 0 to 60 times because we're going to have to make the transition in the next 20 years to a world where energy in all forms is conserved. And, yeah. and I think we are going to see cars like this where we stop talking about 0 to 60 time and we start talking about how well it glides and its, it's drag coefficient becomes a more important number. And that that's fine. But I think in order for us to get to that point, we need to also be at a point where we are comfortable with new composite materials. We're comfortable with new manufacturing processes yeah. and we're, we're comfortable with cars that don't look like cars have looked for the past 50 years. You know, I, so I don't think we get comfortable I, to that. I think I it'd be in a slightly things. different direction. Go on, John. As automobile efficiency improves, and historically it's improved about 1% a year, which sort of doesn't get you far five years from now, but over time, um, there was a study done by M MIT that showed that you can allocate that improvement among three things. You can accelerate quicker, you can keep acceleration the same or get better fuel economy, 
or you can hurt both of those things and accommodate heavier vehicles. And over the 20 years from 1985 to 2005, um, this study found that only something like 15% of the efficiency improvement in the states went toward uh, better gas mileage. Huh. The entire 85% of those efficiency improvements went simply to move around heavier vehicles yeah. because of the increased safety standards that we have and to provide vastly quicker average acceleration. I think what's going to happen in the next 20 years for combustion engine cars is that we'll hold acceleration wherever it happens to be in sort of 2010. And all of the continuing improvements in efficiency will go toward higher gas mileage. And there will probably be some coming down in weight with new high strength steels, as well as more exotic materials, aluminum, carbon fiber, and so on. Interesting. You're talking about new concepts and new vehicles. I think it's a good, a good, a good place to move on to the Blade Glider. John, obviously this was at Tokyo as well um, at, yes. the, at the Motor Show. It's a weird looking car. Nissan has been kind of, Nissan's trying to talk this car up as a future sports model. Um, but we talked about this, we've talked about this at length before and we don't see it happening partly because it's just such a weird car. You know, it's got a, a, the front wheels are less than a metre apart. Um, it's very long. Um, it might have good visibility. It might have good driver, uh, driver um, uh, sort of ergonomics. But in terms of an everyday uh, driver, it is not well suited to that purpose. And it looks in incredibly expensive to produce. So what does it look like in the real world? Um, it's pretty unusual looking. <laughs> um... You know, so many concepts at motor shows these days are lightly disguised next year's production models. I give Nissan credit for producing what I have to assume is really um, a pure concept car. Or if they do produce it, possibly they'll go the XL1 route and only make you know, yeah. a very few and perhaps to a more limited set of regulatory requirements, maybe in one market. Um, we were talking about crash safety standards. In the States, there's this new sort of um, small offset front, front crash standard where you just sort of graze a bridge abutment that might go a foot into your car. This has produced some fairly dire results in a handful of cars. <laughs> um, you know, so which piece of the blade glider hits this little oh. abutment? Is it you know, the front bit or is it the part that has the people about four inches behind it. Um, so it, it's, it would be tough to uh, figure out regulatorily, but I, I do like the concept yeah. and it really shows that Nissan are trying to take their advantage in being a first mover in electric cars and show the whole variety of different and innovative things you can do, even if the production ones are likely to end up looking more like cars that we know. I think we're- And it, and it has been confirmed for production as well. Andy, Andy, what's his name, got up on stage and said it should be in production within three years. Which uh, for which markets did he say? Ah, uh, I can't remember the markets. I'm hoping Europe because I want one. Um, <laughs> although it's going to be priced um, just below their on-the-road sports car. Um, horrible thing that I can't remember the name of. Yes. 370Z? That sounds it. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. So it'd be it's sort of just slightly lower than that. Um, but yeah, we'll be in production. But he 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 said he doesn't know the I think he admitted there will be some um changes Change. made. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how much of the, the current concept actually ends up. I, I really like the, the the V shape of it and I really hope they keep that, but it would make it an incredibly unique production car, I guess, or uh, at least fairly unique production car. It would be very difficult to drive in, in the UK, I think, with some of the roads we have around here, some of the twisty roads. I can imagine that causing problems. Um, also, um, I think my favourite cars from, from Tokyo, oddly enough, um, were a quartet of Prius C concepts. Um, yep. The, the Pri Toyota Prius C, their subcompact hybrid, which is sold as the Aqua in Japan, um, is doing phenomenally well on that market, which heavily, heavily incentivizes hybrids. Um, and so they're looking at expanding the range of Prius Cs. They had a two-door convertible um, in a sort of pinky purple, which was rather distinctive. Um, they had a sort of a Subaru XV Crosstrek one where it's jacked up and it has big lumpy wheels and 
you know, rubber arches over it, even though it doesn't actually have all wheel drive. And then they had a sort of a sport model and a luxury model as well. But I think, I think they're doing well globally with the Prius C, um, which is one of the three highest mileage cars in the States. And, uh, they're looking to do more things with that. I don't know if we'll see any of them in Europe or the States, but it shows where they're thinking in Japan at least. And then Tokyo had a whole load of weird other vehicles. You could do a whole show on those. Yeah, but... yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think you've got to hand it to, to Tokyo because Japan likes its weird concept cars. And I suspect that's part of the reason why we see so many of them uh, is because it's acceptable to have weird concept cars in, in Tokyo in a way that you wouldn't necessarily have elsewhere i'm just going to apologize for a second because i'm looking at my output on the screen and i've just noticed that for some reason my green screen has decided that part of me is green and it's trying to fade me out <laughs> which you know is an interesting thing so uh for for a second there i had a had a top which was slightly transparent so i do apologize for that take of that what you will uh what i'm really excited about from from uh tokyo though is um the, the number of cars that we've seen, uh, the number of vehicles we've seen from Yamaha. Now, Yamaha is not a car maker. Yamaha has dabbled in all the automotive world before, hasn't it, John? Two or three cars, yeah. high-performance sports cars. I believe so. They're better known to me as the provider of engines um, to Ford. Right. But the interesting thing about Yamaha is that they've uh, basically... Uh, connected to this fellow Gordon Murray, the McLaren F1 designer, very, very well-respected designer, who created an exceptionally small, efficient package for a, uh, a tiny car. You, you call it a city car, an urban car. And now um, Yamaha has big, is sort of working with him to make that car a production vehicle because yeah. he, he was not going to produce it. He was looking for someone essentially to take the design in. So um, that could be interesting. Uh, this was certainly the path followed by other Japanese makers who started out producing very, very small cars before they got to be the sort of Honda Accord makers that we know today. And I think one of the challenges um, with this is, you know, this is to do with the way that, um, that, that, that Gordon Murray builds this car. It's all about using low energy, low uh, very high recyclability, low energy, low carbon footprint in the manufacturing process, and then moving, you know, beyond that, um, trying to make the cars as um, as efficient as possible on the road. Now he uses this eye stream manufacturing process, and when he came out with the T twenty five, which is petrol, and the T twenty seven, which is electric. He said very clearly, this is not a car that I'm going to bring to market. This is a car that I want to use to demonstrate the, the way we've made it onto other cars. Now, what's different, John, about that is that it uses a, a, a tubular chassis similar to an F1 car mm -hmm. onto which all the heavy body components are bolted, mechanical mm -hmm. components. And then after that, you then put on top of that, you put on the um the body panels which are very lightweight that's very different to the monocoque construction method which we're now used to isn't it it is um i think probably the the closest example that people may be familiar with is the bmw i3 which has this aluminum uh sort of rolling chassis with all of the powertrain and some of the craft structures in it and then the carbon fiber body or carbon fiber reinforced plastic body shell on top of that yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to see if it ever makes it. But what I'm also excited about as a biker is the fact that Yamaha said it's produced four electric concept motorbikes. They look pretty convincing. And I think, you know, for, for, for the last sort of five years, the electric motorcycle world has been dominated by specialists. The, the, the motorcycle equivalents of, you know, your Teslas and your Fiskers. They've been making specialist bikes that are designed specifically for electric motorcycle market riders. They are sometimes, they have, uh, until recently been aimed at commuters rather than full out bikers but now we're getting people like zero bringing out motorbikes which which hardened bikers would be uh would feel happy to ride um in fact john last time i spoke to your brother i was actually chatting to him about because he's a biker about mm. uh about these motorbikes and that they've essentially come of age and i think yamaha's now gone you know what 
it's time for us to enter the market. And this is bad news for, for Bramo, it's bad news for Zero, it's bad news for Lightning, because Yamaha are a phenomenal motorcycle manufacturer. They have been around the, the world so many times, they know how to do how to design and make a really good motorbike. And I think if they can apply what they know about motorcycle manufacturing to electric motorcycle manufacturing, and they can get some specialists on board, whether to buy them in or to, you know, to license technology, they, they have a, a shoe in there, I think, into the market. And if you read the analyst projections of electric vehicle markets in general, electric vehicles with two wheels will vastly outnumber electric vehicles with four wheels for the next couple of decades. Yeah. You know, they started sort of on the low end with electric bicycles from China. Um, but, you know, electric motorcycles in some ways are an easier concept. They require less investment and motorcycles are less expensive than cars. So it may be that there's a portion of the world where their first experience of electric transport is on two wheels. And I would assume, not being a biker myself, that the same thing applies. Once you get used to electric power in your two-wheeled vehicle, yep. going back to uh, gasoline tends to be rather jarring. Yes, although on a bike, I think it's a very special situation. And interestingly, these Yamaha prototypes, several of them had an automatic stroke manual mode. So you could switch between automatic gear shifting and manual gear mm. shifting. And as a biker, there is nothing better than mm. you know, the kicking down or kicking up. To, to get that gear change to kick in as you want it. Let's move on to the LA Auto Show. Um, less cars debuted there. Um, the, the BMW i8 and the BMW i3, there was a lot of BMW i3 drives there. BMW had a whole load of production cars that it shipped over for people to drive for the first time. Um, but uh, some of the two or two of the debuts that uh, are worth mentioning are the, the Volkswagen Cross Blue Coupe concept. Uh, which is a plug-in hybrid SUV kind of sports utility coupe I don't even know what segment to put this in, John. <laughs> Help me out here. It, it's another one of these German concoctions that you can think of as sports activity, coupe, sedan, fastback, sports car, utility vehicle. <laughs> yes. <thing. laughs> a, a marketing uh, nightmare. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, new, new segment, you would say. Um, and, you know, <laughs> people didn't actually believe that the BMW X6 was going to do well, and it has done very yeah. well if yeah. you wanted a yeah. less usable, larger <laughs> utility vehicle. So I, I think the important one there is the e-golf because the cross blue coupe um, had been seen before. That's one of those cases where the body will likely go into production, but it will not have the plug-in hybrid powertrain, which is sort of the corporate yeah. one. And it's worth pointing out here, this applied to Tokyo too. You know, it's sort of mandatory these days to have an electric or a plug-in hybrid powertrain in your concept, even if the two Mitsubishis um, may or may not have plug-in hybrid powertrains. You know, they will certainly have gasoline-only counterparts to those those concepts that will turn into production vehicles a couple of years hence. But you sort of have to have it now. We've seen this a lot with GM. Yeah. Even if you know the body is just going to go in with gasoline, but the E Golf is going to be Volkswagen's first volume production electric car. Um, I'm still sort of debating for the states whether to consider it a compliance car ahead of the next set of rules or whether they're serious. Um, certainly the Germans have been slow to the party on uh, plug-in vehicles. BMW is, is sort of all in, but both Daimler and Volkswagen are still uh, doing conversions of existing vehicles, although they'd say they've designed the vehicle from scratch to have multiple powertrain options. Yeah, yeah. And I think right. the Volkswagen e-Golf is going to be an interesting one. I think it comes down to price. I think from having driven the the Mark VI uh, e-Golf, Blue Emotion as it was called, which had effectively the drivetrain of the Mark VII e-Golf in it, um, it it was a very competent drive. It felt like a, a Volkswagen Golf should do. Um, it felt like an ordinary gasoline one, actually, but it just happened to be driven by electric. And I think that that sense of normality will win Volkswagen some customers if they can come in at a price point that is acceptable, if they can sell them to more than just compliance states, then yes, it could give the Nissan Leaf a run for its money. If it turns uh -huh. out being a compliance car, then it won't. I, I think it, it won't give the Leaf a run for its money for some years yet, simply because by the time the e-Golf lands in more than Southern California, Nissan is going to be pushing many tens of thousands of Leafs a year That's true. into the market. But, um, so is this I've, going to be the, the Civic Hybrid to, to Toyota's uh, Prius? Yeah, something like that. 
Yeah. Um, I, I drove the last round of Audi A3 e-tron prototype, which was not the plug-in hybrid it is now, but a full battery electric. And I echo your comments completely. It was very, very sorted, nice driving experience, very well done. It had the paddle shifters for different levels of yep. regen. Yep. So I think it's a very competent battery electric vehicle. It's just a question of whether they're thinking of selling hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands. And we'll wait to see. All right, let's move on. EVS 27 took place in Barcelona, Spain this week. You'd think that the electric vehicle industry could have got together and gone, no, this would not be a sensible time to have a conference because Japan, uh, the Tokyo uh, show is going on and also LA Auto Show, but no. Um, This year, it seems that inductive charging seems to be the buzzword. Lots of people going on about inductive charging. Um, But the SAE task force on wireless charging, John, took three years to decide on the frequency of uh, of what would be become the standard, the SAE standard for wireless charging, and three years, uh, and also that those same three years, to decide on how many power levels to have. Now, I can tell you that the frequency is 85 kilohertz, and the power levels are 3.3, 7.2, and 22 kilo, uh, kilowatts, um, which is not anything really to get excited about. Wireless charging is years away, isn't it? I think in high volume production, yes. Um, you know, I used to work for a standards organization. So while three years may seem like a long time, the way these standards work is that first they have to set up a group to decide whether there's an issue to be solved. Clearly there was. Then they have to put out a call for participants. In this case, all of the automakers, all of the people who make EVSE equipment and various other sort of advocates. Then they have to have a whole load of meetings. Every manufacturer or group trots out its um, preferred standard. And then they wrangle for a while before they can commonize on one or more variations. So, you know, three years is not unusual in the standard setting process. And these are going to be standards that will last for decades. But that said, I don't think we'll see large numbers of inductive uh, charging stations on passenger vehicles for some time yet. I can actually see them more for commercial vehicles. Yeah. And we're seeing we're seeing a situation now where where you know the power levels as well. For with Tesla in the market now doing doing a hun- over 100 um kilowatts or you know it, it's it it seems very silly to to be worrying about inductive charging which has which is maxed out at 22 kilowatts when you can just plug a conductive charging unit in and get you know vastly more five times more power it's it's ridiculous um let's it's 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 interesting i i'm at that level the only uh, the problem i have with wireless charging is it requires a lot more it seems to require a lot more effort and a lot more work and at that level of power the only use i can see for it requires a wider project that's bigger than any government which will take up which is the idea of ev lanes where it is embedded in the road you drive along because 22 kilowatts is enough to maintain speed on a motorway and if we can get to the point where you drive your ev onto a motorway and your power for that length of time you're on that road is not being used from your battery it's great but that requires a a infrastructure rollout of the type that governments don't do anymore we can't yeah. even keep our bridges safe, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> exactly. It's true. And we haven't built a new motorway in this country in years. No, so it's, no, no. In uh, fact, the, the, we, the only, well, we're getting, what we're getting here is in the UK, instead of when there's a new motorway needed, instead of trying to just build a new one, what we do is try and upgrade the old one. The M4 and the M5 near where I live, uh, as Mark will testify, has been roadworks for about two years now because two years changed it's it going to come on for another year and motorways. a half so like you have in the, in the states uh, in certain busy cities you'll have um, in the rush hour you can use the shoulder and putting in all the gantries with the lights on telling you whether you can use the shoulder as an extra lane or not use the shoulder as an extra lane is just insane going back to evs 27 though because i missed a story and i'm sure mark's noticed um there was there were lots of Chinese plug-in cars, apparently, said Jim Motovalli. Um, but but he, his question is, why are Chinese automakers still making terrible EVs? He's actually wrote a very I answer funny that, I can blog answer that. post. He wrote a very funny blog post, which said, um, uh, I'm just trying to remember the title of it now. It said something along the lines of, 
Um, these new electric, these two new electric cars are so bad they make golf carts look luxurious by comparison. John, um, you know the interesting thing about the Chinese market is it's the largest car market in the world, but it has probably the least educated car buyers. Um, there's a small sector at the top who know international luxury brands um, and want the same German cars that every other luxury buyer wants. But the huge sort of mass market below that, most of them are buying their first car and they don't have the same level of consumer information. They don't have the same standards. Uh, and so it's easy to sell, as the British would say, crap cars to first time buyers. They'll be more educated in the second time, but Chinese makers, by and large, do not have to compete in the rest of the world, which has higher standards for everything mm. from sort of the consumer facing stuff uh, to crash safety and performance and warranty length and so on. You know, if you get in a new Chinese made car from a Chinese maker that doesn't sell it outside that country, um, you can smell the fumes from all the different plastics and synthetics oh my God. in the cabin in a way that you haven't been able to perhaps ever in the Western markets. They will improve, but for the moment, they're in this isolated bubble with a large enough market where unlike uh, the British exporters and then the German exporters and then the Japanese exporters and then the Korean exporters, in order to build a global-sized car company, they had to export. Their home market wasn't big enough. China is big enough where these guys can continue on for a decade or two just selling to first-time buyers who don't know anybody. And I would also add that that you're seeing a lot of these cars coming into Europe via entrepreneurs who are going, oh, wow, that's an electric car. I could sell that. And they don't know about the automotive world as well. The number of people I've talked to who are selling, trying to sell Chinese cars that they bought over in limited numbers, either in the UK, because we have something called the... It used to be called the SVA, and it's not called the SVA anymore. Um, and I can't for the life of me remember what it's called. But it, it's the low volume production exemption, right? It's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, basically, it, they used to call it the single vehicle approval test. And it was, does it have lights? Do they work? Do the indicators work? Are there any sharp edges? Does there, are there seat belts? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And it means that these cars can be bought in without airbags. They can be bought in uh, without ABS. They can be bought in without all of these other things. Maybe they have to have a, a speed restriction on them. But lots and lots of people who have probably got a little more money than cents are trying to import these cars into Europe. And you see them on eBay. You know, two, three-year-old electric cars that have been bought in People don't know what they are, where they're from or anything else. Um, there is one car we know a lot about, though, now um, moving on. The Cadillac ELR, which is an interesting car based on the Chevy Volt. Essentially, it is a Chevy Volt in a dinner suit. Right, John? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. But yes, it's it's an extremely stylish, very luxurious two-door coupe um, at a price that I think caused much fainting, shrieking, and beating of the breasts amongst <laughs> the advocates. Um, but, uh, you know, I have been told for two years now by Cadillac that the driving experience of an ELR is going to be very different from the driving experience of a Volt. They can do that because the driving experience is entirely controlled by software. And they have a lot of capacity left in their battery. They, they've left a lot of headroom there for, to be conservative for battery life. So, uh, and I believe the motor spec is slightly more powerful. It's the same motor, but I think they've opened it up a bit. Yeah. Um, it's a heavier car. It's got more luxury stuff in it. But it turns out that um, they're actually getting more out of the engine. So the zero to 60 acceleration of the ELR in range extending mode when the engine's running is faster than the zero to 60 acceleration when it's just running on the battery. Um, hmm. Now, if they're only going to make something like 6,000 of them a year, yeah. people seem to think, you know, it's not a big deal, but it's not a terribly encouraging sign um, for plug-in hybrids, which I think we'd all prefer to see skew toward more electric and less gasoline. Yeah, and I would say as someone who's who, you know, has spent, I think I did 750 miles in a vault in just uh, over 24 hours. I went from, on Wednesday evening, from Bristol to Norfolk, Norfolk to Essex, Essex back to Norfolk and Norfolk back to Bristol between sort of 5pm on, 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 on Wednesday and 8pm on Thursday. 
I spent most of that time using the car's gasoline engine. And let me tell you that I I think I've got this theory developing now that, that plug-in cars, range extended plug-in cars uh, or plug-in hybrids, whichever way you want to look at them, are actually the best cars at getting people switched on to electric because more people will buy them because they've got the range extended. But as soon as you start driving them, as soon as you realise that actually this car... Um, when it's driving in electric mode, it does really well on the fuel economy. But as soon as the gasoline engine it kicks in, in the Volt specifically, you can see the miles per gallon drop almost every second sometimes. And that, that's that, that's very, very motivating for you to, to get out and plug in a little bit more often. It's going to be interesting. Like hybrids to- are totally the gateway drug. Yeah, so. yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the ELR. I'm also interested to see what the EPA has to say. Uh, but it's it's time now for our ad break. And that means uh, we have to go and find out about coronaviruses. It was supposed to be just another cargo run, but for Ken Mallory and the three-person crew of the Raven, an anomaly in deep space changes everything. An unexpected turbulence shakes the small ship like never before, allowing a deadly virus aboard. One by one, the infected crew is thrown back in time to relive a near-death experience, only this time, Death may be closer than they remember. My short story, Chronovirus, is available for Amazon Kindle, Barnes & Noble Nook, Kobo, iBooks, Sony, and for all other devices and e-readers through Smashwords. Learn more about Chronovirus by visiting my website at www.aaroncroco.com. Very good there. Now, I'm going to just say something. Either John has someone off camera uh, swishing around a lightsaber or there's feedback every now and then coming from the speakers going back through the microphone. And it's going to just vroom, vroom, vroom. It's very interesting. Anyway, moving on. This section is going to be known as the Tesla section because, because there's always boy, howdy, this has been a week for Tesla. Now, um... Where do we start with this one, uh, uh, John, Mark? Where do we start with it? Let's start with the good news. I'd, I'd like the good news, and then we can tell them off towards the end of the segment. Okay, good news. Go on. The, the, the best news is if you're a Model S driver, that you have now got an extended warranty um, that's just been given to you, which is, is, is lovely to cover fire damage. Although I think Elon had the wonderful line that as long as you're not trying to purposely damage your car, you're covered. Which yes. is pretty yes. much the vaguest but best warranty ever. So essentially, if you crash your Tesla and then try and torch it, <laughs> yeah, that that's not allowed. If like in Grand Theft Auto and you get the gasoline uh, canister and you, you that that's not covered. But, but but as as you proved a couple of weeks ago, uh, in Grand Theft Auto, if you try and burn an electric car, it doesn't burn. The tires burn, but that's it. Oh uh, yeah, it'll burn, but it won't explode. It's good. Although as I discovered last night, the tractor makes an excellent getaway vehicle. <laughs> um, you can have a three-star wanted level and just get away at a tractor. <laughs> you drive it into the stream and then you swim upstream. It's great. Um, <laughs> oh, that was right. terrible. Uh, so anyway, the Tesla Model S um, has been involved in three fires recently. Uh, two of them happened uh, on freeways in the US when debris hit the undercarriage of the car, penetrated the bottom of the battery pack, caused an electrical short, and the rest we all know. The third one happened in in Mexico which is we should we should uh, highlight at this point is out of the jurisdiction of the NHTSA and we will come to the why that is important next um but Elon Musk has, has has been talking about these battery fires and the car fires quite considerably for the past 2 weeks as has of a lot of the mainstream media quite a lot of mass hysteria on certain news networks about this um but we've now got to the point where where um Musk announced earlier at the beginning of last week that Tesla would cover battery fires or fires under its warranty. Now, what I'm curious about is, does this mean if you crash your Model S and you impact your something causes uh, something metallic or something impacts your battery case and then it catches fire? Are you still going to get your warranty repair or are you going to have to claim under the insurance? I haven't the vaguest. I will will find out. But I think, you know, one of the one of the things Tesla did um, in that package of announcements they've had this week is a software update so that um, 
the cars with the optional active air suspension system, uh, which had formerly lowered themselves quite close to the road for yeah. better aerodynamics and less so sort of better energy efficiency. Um, for, for they pushed an update to raise the height of that setting so the cars will ride somewhat higher, mm. uh, mm -hmm. ideally mm -hmm. to, pr to prevent or reduce damage from debris in the road. And uh, it's very interesting to note that the, the update happened and then the next day we had the announcement from, from Musk because Tesla Model S owners don't miss anything. Um, I right. think so one, person actually, uh, one person actually went out and, and measured it and I think it's about half an inch higher for the lowest <laughs> setting. Uh, but interestingly, Musk said in a blog post that he wrote um, on Tuesday morning, um, uh, British time, so it would have been Monday evening, uh, US time, um, that there is another update coming in January, which will allow users to set their own suspension settings. Now, I don't know quite what well, what that will involve, but it's an interesting one. Um, but also, you know, this, this is the next part of the story. Uh, so we've done the first two parts. The third part of the story has caused a little bit of a, a, a bit of uh, problems uh, for Tesla because <laughs> Elon Musk said, and you know, despite the fact that we didn't need to have uh, an update, uh, uh, an investigation, we've contacted the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and we've asked them, would they ever so kindly help us investigate these fires? Um, and whereupon the, the way that it was written was like we asked them. Whereupon the NHTSA went, um, no, 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 we didn't. It was Mr. Noland, wasn't it, Mark? Uh, uh, John. Um, uh, the administrator, David Strickland, Strickland that's said, right, yes. and he, he really had to say this, you know, the NHTSA can't be operating, at, can't be perceived to operate at the beck and call of automakers, the ones that it regulates. So he said, no, we decided to investigate this our own selves. Um, and then, uh, I think the NHTSA is a bit irked with Tesla. You may remember a few weeks ago, Tesla had sort of claimed that the Model S would have gotten a 5.4 star safety rating if there were such a thing, um, because it had sort of aced and gotten five stars on every crash test rating. And then it had some additional equipment. Um, and some additional results that don't factor in. So it would have gotten this thing. Um, the NHTSA <laughs> responded at the time saying, there is no such thing as um, a rating above five stars. They released new guidelines this week specifying in more granular detail exactly how automakers may cite their crash test results. <laughs> and in the last paragraph, they said, um, automakers who do not comply with these guidelines may have their safety ratings reviewed, um, which is to say, you know, now Tesla behave. Um, <laughs> Tesla did not respond to a request we put in at Green Car Reports for comment on that, uh, the, those guidelines, no. but they've got more going on. They, among other things, they lost their VP of sales, George Blankenship, yeah. this week. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, as as uh, your your colleague Richard Reed said uh, in the report that he wrote up for the Car Connection, uh, which can after the statement, which can thus uh, which can para which can be paraphrased thusly, read it in your best school mom voice. Apparently, <laughs> some of you can't be trusted with a calculator. <laughs> I love Richard's writing. It's just brilliant. Um, but I mean, it, it, I mean, there is some serious, some some serious thought uh, thought um, here amongst the automotive press that kind of Tesla's spoilt it for all the other automakers who've been <laughs> behaving, have been doing it, uh, doing it right, have been been using the NHTSA's uh, five star safety ratings correctly, mm. and then Tesla's come along and kind of rewritten the rule book, and the NHTSA's gone. Um, no, this is the way we do it. This is the way you have to do it. But the interesting thing is the buyer alert warning that could be placed on the Tesla Model S or any other car that, mm -hmm. that does this. Now, do you think this is going to lead to any kind of legal wranglings or do you think this is that Tesla will just sit nicely in the corner and, and eat their apple? I, I think Tesla will comply with the standards. You know, they issued their press release that's in the past. They've got sort of bigger fish to fry right now. It does underscore once again that 
part of the way Tesla approaches the world is to do things differently, which is appropriate in many venues. But there's a feeling in the industry that sometimes they shoot themselves in the foot by doing things differently that don't actually need to be done differently. But then I don't work for Tesla's marketing department. So... Yeah, um, I, I I see see where you're coming from with that one. Um, they, they are having to play catch up though in in a world where all the current players and all of the media, or at, at least the majority of the traditional media, is against them. So I can't necessarily blame their marketing department for I think doing I think these tricks, which are I don't think the traditional media is against Tesla. I think they're massively under uneducated, undereducated, and probably these days, time pressed and don't really have the, uh, the opportunity to investigate or get sort of sit down and talk with people to understand the context of what's happening here. But I, you know, this notion that the mainstream media is rooting for Tesla to fail, I think is silliness. So, I mean, this I, I, I wouldn't say they were rooting for Tesla to fail. I, 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 I presume America has got a very similar attitude to what we have in, in the UK, which is anything that's new is bad and wrong. And yeah, that all comes from anyway. But yes. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's. But I think I think this is an important thing to bring up because it's a story that that I, I actually forgot to to include in the show notes, but I wanted to discuss anyway. So I'm going to sneak this one in, and that is that that there's a there's been a study, hasn't there, John, that that says that most buyers don't understand electric cars. They don't know how an electric car works. They don't know about charging. They don't know about uh, where they go to fill up. They don't know the incentives that that are available. And uh, you've run a couple of stories this week on Green Car Reports talking about exactly that problem, getting buyers in cars, bums in seats, people understanding what makes an electric car good, what makes an electric car different, but not necessarily, um, uh, you know, in a way that, that, that makes them feel alienated. Yeah, it's as, as Chelsea Sexton and other sort of experienced advocates will tell you, um, the educational component is huge. I still maintain that electric cars are largely noise level to the vast majority of the car buying public right now. I mean, hybrid cars are still viewed in a sort of a skeptical light, even though they've been around for 12 years and, you know, 50 miles a gallon is a, in the U.S. terms a very understandable, sort of easy to comprehend mm. thing. But, um, you know, the, in the end, what will save electric cars, and I don't for a moment accept these sort of constructs that electric cars have failed and they're a disaster in the market and yada, yada, yada. Um, People love them once they get into them. Once you get someone behind the wheel of an electric car, they get it. They Not only do they see it's got all the standard car stuff, you know, electric windows and a stereo and the acceleration that's appropriate and the ability to go on highways and so on. It's quieter, it's smoother, and it's got great torque off the line. Those are the things that I think, in the end, may make electric cars grow faster than hybrids have grown. Um, yeah. Because hi- many hybrids, frankly, are not that nice a driving experience. Um, but, you, you know, people, car buyers largely look at cars as um, appliances. Car riders don't tend to, which causes a certain disconnect between what car riders want to write about and what people want to learn about when they go shop for a car. But gasoline cars have worked the same way for a century now. Um, They have new features each time. But sort of understanding, wait, I I never have to take this car to a gas station, but I have to plug it in at night like a phone. Okay, do I? What do I plug it into? Okay, is is the cord like my cell phone cord? No, it's a lot thicker, and so on and so forth. This stuff just we all know it because we've been doing this for ages. Yeah. But that stuff is brand new. The automakers aren't doing a very good job of education. Um, there are a lot of nonprofits out there that are trying to. The dealers don't want to because it takes longer. Yeah. They don't understand them either, really. And there's a whole political aspect in the States. So there are a lot of hurdles of education that need to be gotten over. And as Chelsea points out, you need to do it earlier. You yes. need to get people into electric cars, not when they're shopping, but sort of earlier on. So they start to think, okay, this is actually a viable alternative. I don't need a car right now, but it's, you know, this is, this is a real car. Then they're more likely to have them in the consideration set when they walk into the dealer. And I think, I think it, it's something that we as EV drivers, journalists, advocates, whatever 
box people want to be put into who are watching the show or listening to the show because i think most people who who watch and listen to this show already want to have an electric car or already have an electric car um but mm. it's it's those conversations that you have at charging stations where people go what how does that work because every time i'm plugged in now at a rapid charge station you can guarantee someone's going to come in and talk or ask a question you know and and people who use the technology differently i mean um i was i was parked in at the vault um charging the other day i must admit when i'm when i pull in a, a freeway uh, rest stop and there's a charging station that's compatible with the vault or the leaf i will generally plug in even if i don't necessarily need it i'll plug in because it's well parking's Reloader. close to the thing and you know it's a free it's a freebie yeah exactly john uh but i plugged in and i looked across the parking lot and lo and behold there was another chevy vault sitting four cars away which wasn't plugged in mm. and um and it was a really good illustration for a start it shocked me because there's only two chevy vault dealers in the whole of the country and i think there's less than i think there's supposedly less than 150 chevy volts in the country the others are a Vauxhall Amperas, which there are several thousand of them um and funnily enough i'd just come down the freeway in convoy with an ampera and then came off and seen a vault so i was kind of like feeling quite happy at this point and someone comes in along and they ask me about the car and they said is this a hybrid and i go yeah it's a hybrid it's a plug-in hybrid it's a range extended ev you can plug it in or you can just drive it on petrol. And I pointed over to the other one and went, like that one. I went, oh, that's the same car. I went, yeah. Well, why aren't they charging? They don't need to. They've made the decision not to. And that conversation, you could see the gears in their head going, huh, I can have both. Wow. It's like what you were saying earlier, John. It's it's the gateway drug. It's the moving forwards. But, but, but if you are an EV owner, please take time to explain how your car works to people who ask questions i always say you should add an extra five or ten minutes to your journey to be able to explain because that helps getting people touching feeling riding driving an ev will change their mind and it's getting their bums on seats that's the important thing because dealers don't always know and sometimes dealers don't care and uh, we're, we're chasing up some stories in the uk at the moment of dealers who've who've essentially told customers this car will do X number of miles on a charge and the customers found out that it's not true and they're getting really cross about it. And the dealers are going, we just looked in the brochure, mate. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, they, they looked in the brochure that said this car can do or, or it will be able to do up to, it's that up to phrase, which is the yeah, issue. The up same to. with broadband speeds. It's, it's yeah, and, and the same backlash. And, and, and yeah, and exactly, and exactly. And it's all about education. Same thing again and again and again. It's about education. All right, back on to Tesla, though. Tesla scored a 99% satisfaction score on uh, from Consumer Reports this week <laughs> from its owners. And that's huge. You know, I can't underscore enough for people who don't live in the States how huge Consumer Reports really is. It's a magazine that's put out by Consumers Union, which is a nonprofit testing organization. Magazine's been around for 80 years. Uh, they take no advertising. They buy all their cars to test anonymously. So the manufacturers really don't know. Although in the case of Tesla, they probably figured out with the GPS that the car was sitting in their testing yard, which is known. But, you know, that aside, um, they're really well respected. Their ratings count a huge amount. And the Model S did as high as pretty much any car has ever done, which just goes to underscore it's got great crash safety standards. Now we know its owners are really, really satisfied with it. It got a rave review from Consumer Reports, which startled everybody. So it's another sort of validation from a, an independent third party that it's actually a good car. Um, there's been an enormous amount about Tesla fires. I'm hoping it sort of starts to settle down with the holiday week coming up in the States. But, um, you know, the NHTSA now has to go away and do its investigation, which will likely take a couple of months or more. Um, Personally, I'm rather hoping that there are no more Tesla fires, uh, at least for a while, um, if ever. And, you know, we'll see what the NHTSA comes out with. I will say um, Elon Musk has looked a bit more ragged doing the rounds of the talk shows than I've seen him lately. Although I know yeah. he was at a rocket launch either yesterday or the day before yeah. one of his other companies. So yeah. he's got a lot going on. But um, I think Tesla has been shocked at the media firestorm over this. Yeah. 
and they shouldn't really have been. <laughs> and it's their first time. I think, as we said on, on TEN the other day, it's not like they've talked to the NHTSA before other than crash tests. They, 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 this is not the, it's the first time that they've had an investigation in, in, in their existence, I believe. I think the Roadster may have had one for something. Certainly a recall, but 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 you know it's the first time. And uh, talking about the rocket launch there, John, uh, it's worth mentioning. Yeah, first geostationary orbit uh, orbital uh, launch, which is far far higher than anything they've ever done before. So mm. good luck, SpaceX. I hope that's still going well for you um, and everything going. Um, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, George Blankenship um, retired. Uh, he's the guy behind the the Tesla stores. Going to be interesting to see who replaces him because Tesla's kept quite quiet on that, hasn't it, uh, John? Yes. And, you know, I, I feel duty bound to say um, people can retire or people can retire because it's been suggested that they retire or people can retire because they're fed up and furious with their employer or people can retire because um, if they don't, they're going to get fired. We don't know what the case is with Mr. Blankenship. It may well be that he felt he'd done what he came to Tesla to do set up the stores, get them open. They now have stores on multiple continents. We just don't know. But he was a very popular public figure. Yeah. Uh, he acted as MC for Musk in a lot of cases at Tesla events yeah. I've been at. Yeah. And it's a significant loss for Tesla. It strikes me that, 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 that George is the kind of person, I've interviewed him on a couple of occasions, it strikes me from, from what I know of him, and, and that's admittedly not very much, is that he is the kind of person who likes a challenge. And when the challenge disappears, he moves on. And I suspect, you know, he's, he's retired three times now in various different jobs. So I suspect this is, you know, this is the boy. And, and you know, wish him all the best um, for whatever he does next, which I think is actually re actual factual retirement. Uh, Mark, it's time for us to have an audible ad break. And I'm going to warn you lots in advance and talk lots and lots and lots about the fact we're going to have an audible ad break. So you've got time to put the timing in. Thank you. I, I've done that. Thank you very much. Audible is a website online, one of those webby technology things, and you sign up to it and every month you send them a payment, but every month they send you a credit or, or more, and then you can spend those credits on audiobooks. Now, some people may be skeptical about audiobooks, but I can tell you audiobooks are wonderful. One of the greatest pleasures in the world is being read to, and you're being read to by proper actors and you're being read from amazingly well-written books from well-known authors. They have some ridiculous number of audiobooks on their catalogue, from sci-fi to fantasy to biographies to autobiographies, sometimes read by the people who wrote them, all the way through to historical fiction, non-fiction, and even uh, what I really like, which is old BBC uh, radio sitcoms or old BBC radio shows. Um, if you go to audiblepodcast.com, forward slash transport evolved and sign up there you'll get one month for free which is one free audiobook even if you decide not to go ahead you get to keep that audiobook which is amazing and we get a little bit of money for sending you their way and we have a pick of the day or pick of the week this yep. week which which i picked because nikki sent me a panicked email going i don't have a pick of the week i'm sorry uh, <laughs> That's okay. We should we should also note, by the way, before you do this, that there is a three for two offer at the moment. So if you sign up for their platinum program, which you get two uh -huh. credits a month, uh, you can actually have three books. If you do it like today or tomorrow, it ends uh, at midnight uh, on the twenty fifth or the twenty sixth. So you need to do it soon. Excellent. Um, the 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 pick of the week that I've gone for is a it is an old BBC or not actually that old. It's a couple of years old BBC show called John Finnemore's Souvenir Program, and it's the complete first series. John Finnemore is probably one of the funniest writers currently writing in radio in the UK. He is incredibly talented, and if I can write something half as funny as what he's written once or twice, I will be happy. He's the person who wrote Cabin Pressure which is an amazing show uh, with, with Benedict Cumberbatch in it and some other well-known people that's still going on, I believe, now. And, and John Finnemore's Souvenir Programme is his own sitcom, which has just been renewed for, I think it's now in its fourth series, is, is to happen now. Fourth or fifth series is happening now. So, um, yeah. Let, let's, hear to the let's hear the first one. Ah, hello. I saw your sign. Yeah? Man and van. That's me. No job too big or small, satisfaction guaranteed. That's right, yeah. Good, good. You see, I have a killer whale. 
the wall. An orca, if you prefer. And I need it moved from SeaWorld Bristol to Edinburgh Zoo. Right. She weighs six and a half tonnes and must, of course, be kept in strictly temperature-controlled salt water at all times. Why are you telling me this? Well, it's a big job. Yeah. And for you, of course, no job is too big. <laughs> Within reason. Oh, within reason? Yeah, obviously within reason, yeah. I mean, you need a specialist for something like that. Well, interestingly, no, I don't. Because I do not, in fact, have a killer whale, or indeed an orca. Then what what you... I have is a crusading desire to correct false and misleading advertising wherever I <laughs> There you go. It's very, very good. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, awesome. British, British humour at its best. British humour at its best. Right, well, let's move on into our final segment now. Uh, we've done we went through tesla extremely quickly which i'm very pleased about not that we went through tesla very quickly but we were kind of running a bit late there uh, but nissan this week hinted um that battery packs are possibly going to be made options for the leaf so you could have different capacities depending on how far you want to go for a future model i think that's how we understand it isn't it john yes um i want to put a little bit of context around this sure um this was discussed as something that might happen in the future. And I, a number of leaf owners I know have sort of seized on this and are sort of drumming their fingers to walk down to their Nissan dealer and <laughs> order their next leaf and look at the variety of packs. Um, this is probably a 2016 or 2017 yeah. thing, folks. Um, and it hasn't been settled completely that it's going to happen. But, you know, I go back to Nissan being able to read the market as well as anyone. If you look at all the plug-in cars that are on sale, um, they have ranges of all but two of them, or one if you count the Model S as a single model, um, have ranges between 62 and 105 miles. And then you've got nothing between there and 208 or 265 miles. That looks like rather a large market gap and opportunity to me. Yeah. And I think Nissan, who have made more plug-in electric cars than anyone else in the world right now, um, can see the same thing we can see. Yep. So I wouldn't be surprised for this to be the case. I think, as always, the question will be pricing. Now, I think the interesting thing here also is that Nissan makes its own batteries. So it has battery production facilities. Um, so it can pretty much scale up that if it needs to to make more cells to make a bigger battery pack and the gist is that because it makes its own cells because of the way that the leaf's battery pack is designed a future model wasn't even hinted to be a leaf but a future car could offer different battery packs to in a similar way that gasoline and diesel cars come with a range of uh, engine options you know you can go for example, I mean, uh, let's pick Ford. You can go for for the uh, the the uh, four four cylinder EcoBoost engine. You can go for the V6, and probably for a little bit longer, you can go for a V8 if you're lucky on certain models. But you know, so you can choose uh, to have a different vehicle engine in in your particular car, and it gives the buyers a lot more choice and a lot more power and it's also good news for 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 anybody who offers longer range cars because it means that they're likely to get more buyers who are currently sitting there going no 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 i need more range even if they don't that's the important thing isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. it's that safety net the safety net that bmw insists that should be a rex and shouldn't be anything else can be equally given by an additional option for more batteries mm. and interestingly me and my other half were talking today about uh the possible things we might do to our leaf and even something like an extra six kilowatt hours or four kilowatt hours of battery pack that we can just dump into the boots because we don't use the back seats of the boot that much we, we very rarely we fill up the car so we can have this in there it, it's just a nice buffer, especially as the car gets older and the range does start to drop. Yeah. So my hope, and this is a hope upon a hope, because it's a hope that it's going to be, like you say, the leaf and there's going to be many options. So my hope upon a hope is that they become backwardsly compatible and I can go to <laughs> Nissan and go, yeah. I want an additional six kilowatt hours, please. And they give it me a nice Nissan box that I just dump in my boot. I, I think that's unlikely, Mark. Um, but it is. Um, uh, you know, I'm just going to have to buy batteries. Lots but but of, you know, in much the same way that you know, cars from the from the 80s and 90s are now getting engine upgrades. You know, you're seeing classic minis with with all sorts of engines in, um, uh, from Suzuki motorcycle engines all the way up to to Honda um, VTEX. I think eventually 
once Leafs and first generation EVs get a certain age, you will start to see enthusiasts modding their cars in the same way that um, people used to modify engines. And it's an important thing to note here that modifying engines are become, is becoming a, a tougher thing to do because of increasing um, regulation about air quality. There is yeah. no such uh, restriction when it's an electric vehicle because it's going to be the same uh, it's going to be the same before uh, so same emissions regardless of of how much battery pack you've got in there or how big a motor you put in right john right i you know i don't think enthusiasts are going to be a huge part of the market i think the market really will be once you get to you know 7 or 10 years on your leaf or whatever and you're down to 70 or 80% of capacity by that point it's not at all unreasonable to think that there might be a higher capacity replacement pack. So your leaf, which started out, let's say it's 74 miles and is now down to what, 65 or 60 or something, you know, could you get a new pack that might give you 95 miles? Yeah. It might be several thousand dollars, but the rest of the car probably hasn't aged that much. Not that many working parts, right? Um, yep. your, your pale gray upholstery is probably dirty, but that's fixable. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, could you then really extend the life of a leaf out there by paying some amount of thousands of dollars to put a new pack in it, give it more range than it had originally and drive it for another seven or eight years? You know, does that extend the life of the leaf as a used car and give someone else the opportunity for a cheaper battery electric vehicle? Um, backwards compatibility is always tough. I don't know how the software architecture is laid out, but I think that's, you know, a more likely thing. And if you look at battery cost in a Prius, when the first Prius came out in 2000, the cost of a replacement 1.3 kilowatt hour nickel metal hydride pack was something like $9,000. That cost is now down to $2,400. Um, and so I think we could expect a similar percentage of cost decline for a battery electric pack in the leaf plus they're going to be making them uh, in much making the cells in much higher volumes so it'll be as, very interesting to see sort of seven or eight years from now as someone who has a leaf which i think will be the first leaf in the uk to lose capacity bar because my capacity is now at 85 percent, which means it's probably going to tick over in the next month or so um i i hope that 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 that, that better battery packs i mean this has hinted that better battery packs might be on the way or at least that um, replacement battery packs will have the latest technology rather than a technology, an older technology, which they're still having to make to keep these old cars on the road. Um, uh, talking about production, though, uh, Nissan uh, confirmed this week that production at its uh, Smyrna, Ten Tennessee facility is going to be increased, uh, which is good news, isn't it, John? Yes. 20 days and supply I'm... at the moment as opposed to 60? Say again? I think there's 20 days supply at the moment as opposed to 60 from Nissan. Right. Um, they've been somewhat production constrained on Leafs. And this is, this is a case where understanding the production process is important. It actually takes six months from the time that Nissan says, right, we want to build more Leafs in Smyrna to the point where production of the uh, electrode material in Japan can be ramped up and they can ship these rolls of very valuable very fragile electrode material across the ocean to the plant to make the battery cells that go into the batteries to make the leaf. They've got lots of other parts to ramp up to, but the rate, I've talked to Nissan pretty extensively on this. The rate constraining step is the six months lead time from the time you want, you say, right, we need more to more cells actually being able to pr be produced in the Smyrna battery plant adjacent to the assembly plant where they actually make the car. Making mm. the car itself is not the rate constraining step. They can do that more quickly. It's the batteries. It's the batteries. Yeah. And they're saying it should be complete by January time, which means that Nissan's been planning this for some time. Uh, as you as you rightly surmised there, John, I suspect that the uh, very positive sales um, or in August and September prompted Nissan to think about um, increasing the production or at least putting into place plans that it's all, always had to increase production as soon as sales go up. Um, after month, what seems like months of waiting, Fisker is finally bankrupt. 
<laughs> no surprise, John. No. Um, the interesting thing is it's not entirely clear who did buy them because there's this, this company, I don't know, hybrid systems purchase company or something like that, that bought the loan uh, or paid the DOE a fraction of the money it was owed by Fisker to release that loan obligation and is buying the rest of the company. Um, apparently, they're going to restart production of the Karma. Where they do that is unclear, whether it stays uh, in Finland or gets moved somewhere else. Um, volumes are very unclear. It'll be interesting to see what they say. I think they'll probably stay quiet for a while. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did confirm that uh, the last CEO of Fisker, Tony Pozzolotz, left the company in late August. Um, but, uh, you know, the Fisker, the Fisker's main and possibly only advantage is its striking looks. Mm -hmm. I, I went out and interviewed a couple of people who bought Fiskers sort of within the last six weeks. And I said, essentially, why? And they, all, <laughs> did, they did, both said, because it's a stunning looking car and everywhere I go, yeah. people stop me, people take pictures, they box me in on the freeway and take pictures with their cell phones. Everybody wants to know what it is and it's just a stunning looking car. And, and this is the why... thing could have a four cylinder diesel, yeah. <laughs> it could have a, a V8 Hemi. You know, the electric part of the Fisker is not what makes the Fisker special. And I think there may be at least, with the DOE out now, I think there may be at least some argument that you take this striking, luxurious design and you do something different with the powertrain. Yeah, and I think I think this is uh, obviously we've had Bob Lutz sniffing around mm. quite considerably. Uh, do you think he's likely to do a deal um, with Fisker's new owner and, and license the cars, and, or, or maybe get gliders and and because it's going to be easier for him uh, to to buy gliders direct from Fisker and then put in the the vet drivetrain Corvette drivetrain that he wants to uh, put in. Yeah, it, I think it depends on whether the new company sees his uh, his product, which is sort of a two hundred thousand dollar Fisker body with a new nose and a Corvette engine in it, um, as competition on the high end, or a product that's sufficiently differentiated from what they intend to do that it won't be competition. Yeah, you know, I'm curious to see how how they what price they they intend to sell the car, whether it retains essentially the powertrain that it's had so far or whether they do something different in the long run, and also whether they bring out the uh, the uh, convertible coupe and the shooting brake yeah. models yeah. as well. So, so many questions left to be answered. answered. All right. No new Mitsubishi um, eyes in the US until next year. If you go to Mitsubishi's website, interestingly, the first thing that you see when you go to Mitsubishi's website is a... a, a a sign that says get ready for more fun next year 2014 IMEA coming late spring now there's two things that that strike me about this first of all the name okay um this is the first time i've seen mitsubishi usa using the name IMEA. actually they they did sort of a running change over the last year did they for reasons I never really understood. I think it was because a lot of people sort of in our gang, in, in the people who follow electric cars, called it the iMeve anyway. Plus Mitsubishi and then the model name of lowercase i looks like a typo. <laughs> it does. It does. So anyway, the iMeve, which is now being called the iMeve, uh, will come, um, is going to come back to the US next year. It's been, there's it been some interesting things happened to the iMeve in Japan. Nine thousand, the equivalent of nine thousand dollar price cut, John. Is that right on the Japanese yeah. market? I Um yeah. Now in Japan, you can buy different battery pack capacities as well, um, and there are some um, uh, some interesting upgrades as well. Uh, passenger and uh, driver heated seats, as opposed to in the, I think the standard one just comes with the driver heated seat. It certainly did in the UK, um, and some kind of refresh. A refresh, essentially. And it's not a mid-cycle refresh, though, because the iMeve's been around for since 2010. The, well, the iMeve's an old car. Yeah. Now, if you think the original Mitsubishi i, the gasoline version, came out, I believe, in the fall of 2006. Yeah. And the gasoline version is actually now about to be replaced in the K-car market, the small Japanese microcars. Um, 
by a more conventional uh, sort of transverse engine front wheel drive when jointly developed with Nissan. So the egg shaped eye as a gasoline car is going away. They say they're going to hang on to the iMeve in its current form for a while more. I am a little bit skeptical about that car's future in general. Yeah. Um, sometimes being a pioneer, we have this saying in the States where sometimes you can identify the pioneers because they have arrows in their backs. Yeah. Um, you know, the iMeve is a very small car. It's even a small car by European standards. Yes. And um, it may just be too small for the mass market. Yeah. Nissan said, look, the reason we made the Leaf the size it is is because the C segment, compact cars, are the largest volume segment globally. And um, I worry that the iMeve is just a little too close to those golf carts that we try never to manage, never yeah. to mention, yeah. um, to be successful. I think Mitsubishi wants to run it out. But, um, you know, it has not been, it's been a sales failure in the States. Uh, the Peugeot and Citroen versions didn't sell well in Europe. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen with the iMeve. They will have 2014 models in the States, but let me just look at my chart here on the wall. In exactly two years, Mitsubishi has sold fewer than 1,700 yes. iMeves yeah. in the States. Yes, that's, that's, less than, that's less than the sales of either Volt or Leaf. In one month. In one month, yes. last month. Um, yeah. So, you know, and the Mitsubishi I, I remember driving it when it came out and thinking, wow, this is a really quite a nice car. It seems fairly well set up. You know, previously to that, the only cars I'd driven were, were, were previous generation EVs or, or, or any EVs. And I think um, at, when it came out, it was an OK kind of car. Uh, but then the Leaf came out and it just completely blew that away. And, and all of the competition from the other automakers has left Mitsubishi high and dry, um, which, as, as you say, proves that being the first is not always the best. Sometimes being second in line is actually a more uh, sensible position to be. Anyway, that is to be decided, I guess, by the buyers in the market and everything else. Moving on to our and finally, John. Uh, the Nissan Leaf in the UK, fully specced, uh, top of the range Nissan Leaf, uh, after government grant is twenty eight thousand pounds, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, twenty eight, a tiny bit. Yeah. Pretty... If you if you tick all the boxes, I think it's about twenty eight thousand. Some guy on Twitter, and I don't know who he is took this photograph earlier on in Harrods, which is a very posh. Uh, department store in London, uh, n probably known for its um, connections um, uh, to uh, Princess Diana. For those of you who know, um, the 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 oh, sun. Let's, let's say they're known for their food courts. They're known for their food courts as well. But you can buy for Christmas, should you wish, a Harrods V8 Roadster, which is actually an electric electric toy car oh, for kids. kids electric two-seater car yes with um with what looks like stitched leather seats i mean it's the kind of seats that you would get in a posh uh posh sports car Twenty nine thousand nine hundred and ninety five pounds i wonder if you could get a government grant for that one mark <laughs> <laughs> i i uh, probably not no but that would be awesome almost awesome if you could I, I don't get Harrods, it must be said. Uh, I know someone who was going to go there for tea and, and um, my mum just said, um, why don't they just, if they've got that much money, why don't they just go to Marks and Spencer, which is, you know, considered up market by most people, buy a cake in Marks and Spencer, get some nice tea, have tea and biscuits and cake, and then give the rest of that money to a good charity instead. <laughs> did have to agree uh, but that really is it for today's show john thank you so much for joining us um oh, it's a pleasure and uh, do come back soon have a very happy thanksgiving uh, i hope this week is going to be a quiet one for the automotive world um this is the week i think one of the few weeks where those of us who work as automotive journalists can take a bit of a breather isn't it yes yes um... The U.S. Thanksgiving holiday is coming up on Thursday, so most of, uh, well, most of U.S. business sort of winds down Tuesday night. Yeah, 
Yeah. And what we are going to do in Transport Evolved, Mark. We, we, are, we are having a get-together, a non-work get-together. Which we is are having Thanksgiving. Because for those of you all know, I'm married to an American. Uh, my best friend is married to an American. Um, and so we're having 15 people in our house, uh, which is the studio that you see the outtakes. You, if you see the outtakes on, on TEN, you'll see this, this room, which is just about wide enough for my green screen, which is sort of, what, five feet, six feet? No, no, probably seven feet wide. Uh, we're going to have 15 people in a room that's seven foot wide by about 15 feet long. And Are you I'm, doing the whole turkey stuffing? Yes, we've got yams. turkey. We've got we've got of Primer course sauce. we've got yams. We've got all sorts. Um, we're going to have heavenly hash. Which for I those of you no who have no idea what I'm getting into, heavenly hash is essentially like a very very sweet fruit salad. It's probably the best way of putting it with all sorts of. Oh, things. I was thinking you were talking about the ice cream. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, which is very nice. Um, with with lots of cream and things in it. Um, and we will be having biscuits friend of uh, someone's bringing biscuits uh american biscuits not british biscuits um and i'm yes, so gonna have to bring thing. a br very british dessert aren't i yeah something very treacle british pudding. like treacle pudding or spotted dick twiglets or uh, and maybe <laughs> battenberg cake battenberg yes <laughs> uh, but there'll be way too much food and and probably not enough time to, to eat it and, and probably on on friday morning if mark and i both survive we're gonna try and do ten together that will be yeah. an interesting one. Try and do 10 together. Um, but we are not doing any any news items on Thursday, are we, Mark? And we too are taking a slow week. So if you are in the UK and you wonder why our output's gone down, it's because it's Thanksgiving week. And uh, as our stats tell us, something like 80% of our audience are in the States, despite us trying desperately to do it in the UK. Seems Brits don't want electric cars, Mark. We should move to America. Damn, damn ex-colonials. <laughs> oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> uh, thanks very much to everyone for joining us. And as always, don't forget to plug in. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.